Good morning. And welcome to the Dallums. You're finally back from COVID, and it's good to see you. Bless you. Bless you. Well, the summer marches on. Uh, I don't know if you were outside yesterday. I was actually cooped, cooped up inside most of the day, but it was just a beautiful day. And we are now moving into my, my favorite season of the year, uh, actually my favorite uh, part of the summer. Uh, I call this, this will only mean something to a few of you. This, it's like tift weather, and like the bay, the bay is dropping now, and it's getting to be tift depth. Tift is the Texas International Fishing Tournament. And it's just, I love August. As a fisherman, as an outdoorsman, I, I love August. Uh, and so we're, we're about there. We're about there. And, and, and here at the church, uh, as we speak of summer, this is the summer of love. That kind of sounds weird unless you know that we're studying uh, the, the, the first epistle of John. The first John. Uh, it's a very short book at the end of the Bible. And it's all about love. It's really all about love and how the church should be marked by love, and how you and I as Christians should be marked by love. And so, so it's the summer of love. It was the, the summer of probably 1976 through 1982 or so. Uh, many of those summers, if not every one of those summers, as a little boy... Uh, growing up in a house just a mile or two from here, um, I would go to bed in the, su- in, in, in the summertime, uh, but I wouldn't go to sleep. Now, this didn't happen during the school year, I, probably because I was, a, I was a tired little boy, and so I fell fast asleep, fell right to sleep. But in, this, in the summertime, as a little boy in grade school, I would lay, a bed, lay in bed at night, and I would, I would go through this experience that was really excruciating. You know, I, some of you that grew up in, in the church, you've told me that you had the exact same experience. Maybe it wasn't when, when you went to, to bed at night, maybe it wasn't in the summertime, but you might be able to relate if you, if you grew up in the church. I would, I, would, I would go to bed, but I would lay awake at night asking myself, and asking God, oh, am I really a Christian? Am I really, am I really saved? Oh, am I really going to go to heaven when I die? And as a little boy, I would worry and I would fret over that in ways that I don't worry and fret as an adult because I think I have a deeper understanding of the love of God and His, His, His powerful work of salvation in my life. But, but at that point in my life as a little boy, and maybe you've experienced this even as an adult, to be like, have I, have I done enough? Have I, have, I, have, I, have I done the right stuff? Uh, uh, actually, because I, I grew up in a, in a church that had pretty solid theology, I, I didn't worry so much about if I'd, you know, if I'd done bad things or not done good things, but I really worried about this prayer that I'd been told about. Maybe you can relate to this. This prayer that I'd been told about. I, it had been explained to me that I, I needed to pray this, this prayer, and perhaps, perhaps in that setting, in that context, there was, there was too much emphasis put on that, that one single prayer. In fact, I'm pretty sure there was too much emphasis put on that one single prayer. And so I would lay in bed at night, and I would worry. I would think, like, I was a pretty logical kid. I mean, I, I, was, I was actually an awesome kid. But I was a pretty logical kid, and so I had this, this radar for, like, stuff that didn't make sense. You know what I mean? And I had this pretty high ethic, and I had this pretty high conscience. Uh, and so as a kid, I would be like, man, if praying this prayer gets me saved, if praying this prayer uh, me, me, means that I'm a Christian, then, man, there's a lot riding on that prayer. And yet in my mind, even as a little boy, there's this logic said like, man, that seems really two-dimensional, really flat, or really not, not super developed, that the Lord, the, 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 the God in heaven would put, all, like, the, my, the, the, my, my eternity is staked on, like, this prayer that I'm going to pray as a little boy. 
And so it, it, it didn't completely make sense, and so I would worry. I would fret, like the sinner's prayer syndrome sort of a thing, which I, I, I well-meaning culture, but I, I've, I've talked to a number of people that experience that. And so what I want you to know, if, if you're new to River Church, if you're new to the story of Jesus, which we call the gospel, another word for that, is a phrase would be the good news, the good news of Jesus Christ goes something like this. Um, You don't have to work and fret and worry and do good to be saved. In fact, Jesus himself, precisely because he knew that you and I are broken, we're messed up, we are utterly incapable of living up to God's standards, because we were born into sin. Jesus, because he knew all that, he went to the cross, and what he did was he paid this penalty. We've talked about it over the last uh, few weeks, uh, propitiation, that he, he absorbed all of the, the penalty, all of, this may scare you if you didn't hear last week's sermon, it may scare you anyway, but all of God's wrath that is rightfully pointed at sin and sinners, Jesus absorbed all that, And so as I connect spiritually with Jesus through submission, not necessarily through one, like one prayer that I write on on a piece of paper and I date, but as I as I in prayer and in submission, as I connect with Jesus Christ spiritually, then 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 all the wrath that is rightly pointed at me, all of God's wrath, it is it it was it was absorbed by Jesus. He paid the penalty. Do you remember what he said to Telestai? He said, "It is." finished. And that's what he meant. Like the, it's paid in full. It's all done. It's all done for eternity. And so if you're wondering like, man, have I done enough good? Have I done too much bad? I've really lived a jacked up life. What if I'm headed for hell? What you need to understand is that if you connect to Jesus, if you connect with Jesus spiritually today, he takes care of all that. He wipes the slate clean and you are saved. Okay. Now, here's where we're going. Here's where we are going today. Here's the question I want to ask you. Is there an answer to the question, or any, how do I, how do I know if I'm a Christian? How, how do I know if I'm saved? Like, I too lie, lie in bed at night, worrying about, you know, have I done enough good? Have I done too much bad? And Pastor Randy says, that's not what it's even about. That's, that, that doesn't even factor into the equation of salvation, the good stuff that I've done, the bad stuff that I've neglected to do. Um, I didn't say that right, but you know what I mean. Uh, that doesn't even factor into the, the, the equation, and therefore, you're asking me, and I'm going to answer, uh, you're asking me, is there a way for us to, like, know, for me to know that I am a Christ follower. And, and what we learn today from today's passage in 1 John 2 is the answer to that question is yes. Y- y- yes, there, there is. I'll, I'll, just, I'll just cut to the end and then I'll come back and develop it. But, but here's where we're going. What, what Jesus and John the Apostle teach us in today's passages is that there is a type of loving that every believer should be engaged in because it's just this byproduct. It's just this result. Like if you're a Christian, this is what you do. There is a type of loving that is a byproduct of uh, you um, being a Christian. It doesn't make you a Christian. It's just simply what Christians do. It's a byproduct. And also, get this, they, this may not ring well in your ears, but there's a type of hating. There's a type of hating that, that Christians engage in. It's just a byproduct of who we are as Christ followers. There's a type of loving that you should look for as evidence in your life if you're a Christ follower, and there's a type of hating that you should look for, just a byproduct of who you are as a Christ follower. The first type of loving, uh, the first, this type of loving, this is what we're going to talk about First, it's, it's what marks us as Christians. And before we go to what, what John the Apostle says way in the, at the end of the Bible, what we're going to do first is let's look at what Jesus says early in the New Testament 
during his life here on earth in the Gospel of John, also written by John the Apostle, because he was there. John chapter 13. This is the Gospel of John. This is Jesus on earth. Here's what he says to his disciples, to his apostles, and to us. Because he knew that one day we would read what he said on that day. Jesus says this. He says, a new commandment I give to you. Underline or, or just make mental note of a new commandment I give to you that you love one another just as I have loved you. You also are to love one another. By this all people will know that you are my disciples. Clear evidence that you're my disciples. A byproduct, Jesus says, of you being my disciple. By this all people will know that you are my disciples if you have love for one another. The word of the Lord for which I give thanks. Now, the, the question that is begged is, why does Jesus say this is a new commandment? What is new about this? Why does he say a new commandment I give to you? I mean, we know that the nation of Israel, that they were, they were supposed to love one another. They're supposed to love one another. That was a part of the ethic of who they, who they were and are as, as Jews. And so Jesus says a new commandment, and his disciples maybe asked in, in, internally the same question that I asked. What's new about this? Well... What's new about this is that Jesus had never before walked the earth and, and exemplified this sort of love for us. Jesus, it, this was, the, this was the, the moment in time, these three years, when Jesus said he took on flesh and blood, but he continued to be fully God. He was the God-man, and he, he exemplified what it means to love God your neighbor, to love your brother, to love one another. And then you catch what he says. He says, just as I have loved you, you also are to love one another. So he says, you've never seen me love like this before, but now that I've exemplified it before you, this is what I want you to do. I want you to, 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 to love like this. And you know who's there that day? You know who's on the scene and, and watching Jesus every move? It's John the Apostle. John who wrote this book. John who wrote 1st, 2nd, and 3rd John. John who wrote the book of Revelation. Imagine young, impetuous John the Apostle Right there, hearing Jesus say these words, he's given us a new commandment. This is important. Watching Jesus exemplify love right before them. Remember, he, he was formerly this impetuous like brat. He was the son of thunder. And, and now, this new nickname, I've told you all three weeks, so let's say it together. His new nickname was the one whom Jesus loved. The one whom Jesus loved. And so, so John is, is there on the scene, and he really hears Jesus. Because he, he captures the essence of that statement that Jesus made that day. He captures the essence of that, and he records it, not only in the Gospel of John, Jesus' words, but he records it later on under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit in his own words. John the Apostle, John the Church Father. He writes those down again because he saw it, he heard it, he experienced it, and he wants it for us. So now let's look at what he wrote many years later, old man John, what he wrote in 1 John chapter 2. He says this, <clears throat> 1 John chapter 2, verse 7. He says, Beloved, I am writing to you now capture what he says. he says. I am writing to you no new commandment, but an old commandment that you had from the beginning, meaning, meaning from before the, the Pentateuch was even recorded, even written down. The old commandment is the word that you have heard. Says, At the same time, 
See, at the same time, it is a new commandment that I am writing to you. Which is true in him. This is reference to, to Jesus earlier, the verses that we haven't read today. He mentions Jesus. This is, which is true in him and in you. He's making this connection. It's a new commandment because it's the, it's the love of Jesus now born out in you. He says, uh, it's a new commandment that I'm writing you, which is true in him and, and true in you, because the darkness is passing away and the true light is already shining. Whoever says he is in the light and hates his brother is still in darkness. Whoever loves his brother abides in the light, and in him there is no cause for stumbling. But whoever hates his brother, this is, John has this way of this circular thinking. He's constantly coming back to what he said and just making sure we understand. Verse 11, whoever hates his brother is in the darkness and walks in the darkness and does not know where he is going because the darkness has blinded him. The word of the Lord for which I give thanks. So, so, so John the apostle, John the disciple of Jesus, the one whom Jesus loved, the one who's leaning his head on, on Jesus' shoulder in that, in that famous Last Supper Da Vinci painting, the one whom Jesus said, the one whom Jesus said, uh, the one to whom Jesus said, "Behold your mother, mother, behold your son from the cross." And then he takes care of Jesus, mom from, from that day forward, brings her into her, his home. That, that John, he's now saying, with great authority, you know, this, this isn't a new thought, and, 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 and yet it is a new thought. He's, he's struggling with the same tension that we feel like, well, we've always supposed to love. And even if you're not a Christian, you ought to love. Even if you don't believe in Jesus, you ought to love. Everybody has some capacity to love. Even people that aren't Christ followers, they love their kids, they, they love their spouses. They, 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 there is this, this sort of love that we've all been, you know, my love makes the world go round. There's always been this kind of love. This isn't a new commandment. And this is, and yes, and yet it is a new commandment. It's a new commandment. I'm going to say something new now. Because Jesus gives us, Christ followers, a deeper capacity to love like we've never loved before. What John, what Jesus are saying today is you can love now at a deeper level more fully than you ever have before. Why? Yes, because Jesus gave us an example. That's absolutely true. But there's another reason that we haven't mentioned yet. And that is because the power and the presence of Jesus Christ lives in you. That's why John is, 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 is making this connection between him and you. You and him. We saw that. We saw that in the passage we just read. Him and you, you and him. What he's saying is, Jesus is now in you. Why do we know that? Because last week, go listen to the sermon online if you, if you, had, if you didn't hear it. Last week, what, or maybe it was two weeks ago, what John tells us, I think it's in, in the first few verses of, of, of John chapter two, of first John chapter 2, uh, maybe it's in the latter of, 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 the, of uh, chapter 1. But what he tells us is that Jesus is our parakletos. He is our helper. He is our uh, confidant. Now, I told you what's really kind of odd about that is just about every other uh, passage in the New Testament, the parakletos, the, the helper, the confidant, is the Holy Spirit. And that is true. The Holy Spirit lives in you. But what John really wants to drill down deep on is that the love of Christ has now moved into and resides in in you. You are spiritually alive because of Jesus' work on the cross, and you now have a capacity to love more deeply than you've ever loved before. And, and that's what makes it particularly difficult, uh, particularly um, precarious when we realize, wow, I'm a Christ follower, but I'm still a curmudgeon. Like, I still, I still treat people poorly. I, I really, I'm not very good at loving. Like, I'm a doer. I'm not a lover. And, and both Jesus and John say, you're going to love at a deeper level than you've ever loved before if you are my disciple. So, so I use the word like Christian, uh, Christ followers, saved. You notice John the apostle uses slightly different phrases to mean the same thing. He talks about walking in the light. 
and walking in darkness. Remember week one, I, I preached on the fact that, that, that John says, man, many of you, you, you say you're walking hand in hand with the Lord, and yet you continue to walk in darkness, and, and you are, hard word, but he says, you're a liar, and, and you make God out to be a liar because, because you cannot walk in darkness and have fellowship with God. The Lord, and he's just continuing in this circular thought to drill down. Week after week, we see this drill down deeper and deeper and deeper. And la last week or two weeks ago, he talked about Jesus being our parakletos, our helper. And now he's saying, and the result of that is this credible capacity to love. So today's topic, um, the one who, love, who walks in the light, that's a Christian. The one who walks in light loves in a certain way and hates in a certain way and and the one who walks in, in darkness also loves in a different way and, and hates in, in a different way. Love and hate, hate and love. We throw these words around all the time. Like I said, man, I, I love Coke Zero. I mean, not that much, but I, I, it's pretty good. I love Coke Zero, right? I, I love, I, I, I hate, I hate standing in line at HCB. You guys know that if you guys just go way over there to the right, you don't even have to stand in line. Like, like 5,000 people standing in line. You just go over there and you can go right. Y'all know that? Do y'all know that? Okay. Because it seems like people don't know that, but I go over there and I in and out like that. But why? Because I hate standing in line. We throw these words around. I, 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 love, I love rain. I hate cold wind. I, I, love, I love a sunburn and air conditioning, like combined. You know, like... Uh, <laughs> Somebody else does. Uh, the things that I, I say I love and I say I hate, but it's, it's pretty shallow, right? We throw these words around, and yet, yet in this passage, Jesus and John, the disciple, they say what you love is profound. Who you love, how you love is profound. And, 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 and what you hate or who you hate, it's profound. And they're, they're, they're indicators of something really, really big. We were having a conversation, a uh, little staff meeting on Wednesday, and, and we had this conversation that, that was, I thought, interesting. And it, it, we were discussing, we were discussing the fact that, and you, I'm sure you trust our motives, right? I'm sure you trust our motives, but we were, we were discussing the fact that I was saying, you know, guys, I said, I, I can't tell who's walking, walking in, in the light, walking with the Lord, I can't, like, look at you and read your eyes, you know. And I, I'm a pretty intuitive guy, but I, I, man, for good and for bad, you guys fool me all the time, right? Like, I can't look at you and I can't decide, like, you're walking in the light, you're walking in the darkness. Like, I don't have a list. Um, and I don't, I don't try to do that. But, but when I do on occasion, I can't do that. Because we all can fool each other to some degree. But I think if you're really honest with yourself this morning, you, you can look for these indicators. You can look for these indicators. You can say, you know, God's salvation, has, it rests upon me. John says there's a way. Jesus says there's a way. Self-examination, look at the type of love you partake in, look at the type of hate that you partake in, and, and there's something to be said for that. Okay, so let's unpack this passage just a little more um, a little more deeply now. So number one says that Jesus, if we can go back to that passage again, I think it's, it's next. I'm writing you a new commandment. There you go. Don't love the world, things in the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, what I want is the... Uh, yeah, that's the right passage. No, I want verse 7, rather. That's where I want. Back, I want to reread what I, what I just read. There you go. There you go. There you go. Well, I'm, I'm, right, I'm not writing you a new commandment, yet I am writing you a new commandment. And then he goes into Jesus. And, and this, the first like, main point I want to draw out of this is that he's saying that there is this Jesus who is a game changer. He's giving you this new capacity to love like never before. And then he makes this next point that, that he who loves his brother walks in, um, who hates his brother walks in darkness. And then he makes the, the next point, he who loves his brother walks in light. But then the fourth 
the fourth sort of point out of this passage, this, this is what I want to drill down a little deeper on. He says this. He says, there is a blindness, a type of blindness that's caused by hatred that leads to confusion, that leads to lostness. And I, I bring this out because some of you, you might be able to relate to this. You might be living here at this moment in time. See, he says, he says um, going on to the next screen, he says, Whoever hates, verse 11, whoever hates his brother is in the darkness, walks in the darkness, we've already covered that, and does not know where he is going because the darkness has blinded his eyes. Listen, I've known people, I've had friends, maybe, maybe I've experienced this in my life at times, but, but I, I've known people, maybe this is you today, who they, they, they live, they live every day of their lives with, a, with an anger, a hatred, often toward a family member or an extended family member. They, they live with that day in and day out to the point that ultimately it blinds them. The anger, the, the darkness, the, the, the hatred, it, it, it creates this blindness that it leads to confusion each and every day. It leads to being stuck where you are, no progression in your life, not able to move on in life, a sense of lostness, a sense of blinding of the eyes so that you're stumbling around, that, that you're, you're unable to really, really make any progress in life. And, and listen, nothing does that in a person's life to the degree that hatred and anger you, you walk in the darkness, but you're not just walking in darkness. You're stumbling through the dark. It's an old Jayhawk song. You're stumbling through the dark. You're, you're unable to figure out where you're going. I've been checking myself lately. I have days where I'll get up, and I just, like, something is off. And, and I just, I, I feel like I'm impatient with, with the driver, and I'm, patient with the, the cashier. Maybe they don't know it because I, I try to, I try and do, but it's there. It's there nonetheless. And I'm impatient. I'm judgmental. And I ask myself, like, where is this anger coming from? Where, where is this low-grade sort of anger coming from? And if I, if I might add, if I might suggest, is there really any difference between anger and hatred anyway? Hatred and anger. Anger and hatred. You're like, you know, I'm angry with my spouse. Like, I, don't, I don't hate my spouse, but I mean, I'm angry, and maybe I'm chronically angry. And I, and I would ask you, is there any difference? Is, is, is the effect, is the result really not the same? If you're like me, you can relate to this. Uh, maybe you're so, you're so often in, so patient with yourself. Like I, I give myself a pass all the time. But, but no one else. You might say, I, I was rude. I was rude, but she made me. She made me rude. She made me rude because she, she, she knows when she pushes those buttons, I'm going to be this way. You know, or maybe you, you, you say, like, everybody else in the world is dumb. Why can't everyone else just, just, just work as hard as me, just stay as busy as me? Just see things the way I see things. Those phrases probably ring more true than, than you or I really want to admit. Is there really any difference between hatred and anger and anger and, and hatred? I, I kind of look at that as the older brother syndrome. I'm like, man, why can't everybody else, you know, including my, my punk brothers and sisters, you know, I, why can't everybody else just get in line and just do things the way I think we should do things? Older brother syndrome. Or there's another syndrome that I see often, maybe you can relate to, and it comes out of an old, old Derek Webb song. It says, I hate everyone but you. He's, he's saying that to his, his then wife. Um, I hate everyone but you. And maybe that's where your anger, hatred sort of grows out of, that mentality 
It says, like, you just, you know, my, my, my wife and my kids, but I hate everyone else. And what does that lead to? You disassociate, you, you, you pull away, like nobody else is welcome in your little circle. And the problem with that is Jesus says that we will be marked by Christ's love. And that will be the indicator, the, the result, the byproduct of us being Christ's followers. So there, there are people we don't love and we should love. And then the second part of what I've been saying to you, there are things that we shouldn't love, that we should hate those things, but, but, but in, in an exact opposite direction of how Christ calls us, those things that we should hate, we, we love those things. And then the people that we should love, we, we hate those people. We disassociate with those people. We, we draw away. We pull, pull back. We, we cloister ourselves, just me and my little family, or just me, myself, and I. But then we love the things. Well, you'll see. Let's go on. Verse 15 says this. We've already, been, we've already been called to love our brothers, love our sisters, love one another. But then verse 15, now here's what we ought to hate. We, we have it so backwards. We have it so backwards. Just do not love the world or the things in the world. Does that mean we should hate people? No, of course not. We've already been told we're to love people. So this must be talking about something else. Do not love the world or the things of the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, the desires of the flesh and the desires of the eyes and the pride of life, is not from the Father, but is from the world. Verse 17 is so important. And the world is passing away along with its desires, but whoever does the will of God abides forever. The word of the Lord, for which I am thankful. See, we have a big level of comfort as human beings for like a dichotomy in how we live, like, like being two-faced. You mean one way one time and one way another way another time, or like loving and hating and hating and loving and just being, you know, we say like we're complex, and we are, you know, we're complex as human beings. And so we have this, we have this, this, this great affinity for dichotomy in how we live, and yet when you go to the scriptures, it really like, like, God's light. In him there is no darkness, right? And, and we're called to, to, to walk in the light. And we're, we're called to emulate Jesus' love. And there's no, like, there's no real, like, just, you know, be okay with, like, you got a little bit of love and a little bit of hate, and you're, you're kind of on the fence. You're kind of going both ways. Like, th- there's really no, no freedom like that in the Scriptures, although we give, give ourselves mostly. I don't really give you the freedom to, to live a dichotomous life. I just give myself a a great deal of freedom, I and mean, you probably do the same thing, and, and yet and here, it, it makes the thing of these two big statements we're going to put on the screen. Number one, those who walk in darkness, they hate people, but they love the world. And then, in contrast, those who walk in the light, this is what we're talking about today, am I a Christian, am I a Christ follower? Well, is there any evidence in my life that what Jesus and John say is that those who walk in the light, they love people and they hate the world. You know, maybe you're one of those people like, you know, I should be, no offense, uh, well, let me say it first and then I'll, then, I'll, then I'll apologize. Like, maybe you're one of those people you say like, I should be a cobbler, which is a shoemaker. I should be a cobbler, oh, this is where I might offend people, or an accountant because like I hate people. Like I just want to like go to my desk and work all by myself all day because I hate people, and no offense if you're a cobbler or, or, or a, an accountant, but, but and it's, those are good trades, but, but Jesus calls us not to avoid people, not to say I'm just going to be isolated, but to be in love with people and to hate the world. What does it mean to hate the world? Because a key characteristic of a person who walks in darkness is you love the world. So you don't want to be like that because you don't want to walk in darkness. You don't want to, you know, you're looking for evidence that I'm walking in light. But what does that mean to, 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 to love the world? What does it mean to, to hate the world? Well, as, as, Paul, or as John continues to develop in this passage as we go on over the next few weeks, you'll see that, that to love the world is, is the fleshly desires of the world. You know, the eye, the eye candy of the world. The, 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 the pompous sort of 
prideful sort of way that the world lives. Like, maybe you went to a meeting last night. Maybe you went to a party last night, and everybody's, everybody's posturing, and there's a, lot of, there's a lot of pomp, and it's like you're on parade, and like, like, like everybody's there to impress one another, and it's just kind of the standard way in which the world rolls. And when that becomes so, so uh, meaningful to you, that that's what you live for, that's what you desire, that, that the eye can be of the world, then you are, in fact, in love with the world. When I was a little boy, I had this, uh, it was my first bicycle that had gear changers. Back then we called them 10 speeds. They don't call them that anymore, but they call them 10 speeds. And that meant something. If you said, I got, you, I got a 10 speed, it meant you had those, like, uh, you know, those bent handlebars, and you had little shifters down here. And I got my first 10 speed, and it came from, like, Montgomery Wards or something like that. Right? Uh, maybe Kmart. I don't think there was a Walmart back then. But Kmart or Montgomery Wards. And I got it. It was powder blue, and I really liked it. I was probably in, I don't know, fourth grade. But I remember... I remember that, that, that right on the top tube, on the top tube, it started, the paint started bubbling up like things do in South Texas, and then a little rust spot, little rust spot started appearing. And, and, and I, my mother didn't know about the rust, but I remember my mother saying that, that, that um, Randy, you need to not leave that bicycle out in the rain. You need to take care of that bicycle because that, that, that bicycle cost us you know, good money. You know, really, she was a really good, like, 1970s sort of mom. Like, that's how they spoke in the 70s, you know. You take care of your stuff because we paid good money for that. And she was well-meaning, but, but I, again, I'm a super conscientious kid. I remember <laughs> in bed at night when I wasn't worried about whether I was going to heaven or hell, I would, I would worry about this bicycle because, like, the bicycle's rusty. And I'm like, my parents spent good money on this thing, and I'm not taking good care of it. And when actually I was, it, just, it was just the salt air, right? But, but what was being, what was being um, taught, or what I was at least picking up, was that, that the stuff of earth is significant. And maybe it's like most significant. And I often wonder, what, I, what am I teaching my children about stuff and things and possessions and, and money and, and the long-lasting value, am I teaching them to love the world? Or am I teaching them to love people? See, in this passage, number one, a key characteristic of one who walks in the darkness is you love the world. Uh, uh, second point is that this lifestyle, this lifestyle is temporary. See, when I, when, I, when I teach my kids or when I am being taught, like, you need to take care of your stuff, then you should take care of your stuff. You should be good stewards of your stuff. But when you, the, you, you need to take care of your stuff because this is long-lasting. It smacks in the face of, let's go back to this passage again, it smacks in the face of verse 16, the world, the desires of the flesh, the desires of the eyes, the pride of life, is not from the Father, but is from the world. And the world is, what does it say? Passing away along with its desires. Whatever does the will of the Lord abides forever. But going back to verse 17, the world is passing away. What is John saying? John is saying, look, it, is, it makes sense. It makes sense for you to major on what the, what the Lord majors on, which is loving people, and to minor on what the Lord minors on, which is the stuff of this earth. And we tend to major on the stuff of the earth as though that, like, somehow, like, like it's, it's, it's ethical to be a Christian, but it's economical to, to it's, 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 it's a good investment to, to live for this world. And, and John is saying, no, it doesn't even make sense to live for this world because this world is temporary. It's fleeting. It's passing away. It's all going to rust. The world is passing away, and therefore, honestly, if you believe in Jesus, and if you don't, then with, with all respect, I realize you, you, should, 
you should engineer your life in a different fashion. But if you're a Christ follower, then what this passage is saying is it makes no sense to chase after the things of the world because they're passing away. We see it in those months when you've got enough money to live on, but you, you worry about money anyway. Now, I realize and I respect the fact that some of you are going through very difficult financial circumstances right now, but, but can you at least remember, can many of you relate to the idea like, yeah, Randy, I, I have enough, and yet I still worry about, about getting more. Why? Because we, we, we're, we, we have this short game mentality. Here's what I mean by that. There will be a year, it'll be 100 years from now, uh, or 1,000 years from now, probably more like just 50 years from now, which, when I will say either, I will say, wow, I really played the short game. Like, I laid it all on the line for this world. I live for, for, for the stuff of earth. And now here I am on the other side of eternity, and, and I, I played this short game. The stuff I invested in it was just junk. It all rusted away. Or 50 years from now, I will, I will contemplate my life, and I will say, I invested in the long game. Like, I was a person who lived for eternity. And, and that's really what John is saying right now. No, not only is it bad for others when you love this world and the, and the stuff of earth, it's bad for you because you're playing the short game because the world is passing away. It's temporary. It's fleeting. He says, but if you walk in the light, if you if you, if you live the way Jesus calls us to live, which is, is loving others, then you will, it says, abide forever. I mean, it couldn't be more clear than it is in this passage that people who walk in the light, they are people who, who, who major on love, who love one another. People who walk in darkness, they major on loving this world. Continuing on. We're almost done here. Continuing on. Verse... Uh, Verse 18, it says this, Children, it is the last hour. It gets real, it gets real here. It says, As you have heard that, that Antichrist is coming, so now many Antichrists have come. Therefore, we know that it is the last hour because the Antichrists have come. They went out from us, but they were not of us. For if they had been of us, they would have continued with us, but they went out. That it might be plain that they all are not of us. Okay, what in the world is that talking about? Well, if you, if you heard week one of my sermon, you know that I said that this whole book is written in response to the fact that, that a group of people had left the church. Um, they had decided that they didn't believe that Jesus is who he says he is, and they had walked away. And what, what is astounding to me is... In this passage, uh, John's high view of the church. I mean, I wouldn't dare say, like, I, I would never say this, but I didn't. He did. And that is, he says, the people that left the church, they left because they're not really of us. They're not really Christ followers. They didn't just leave this church. They left the church. And then he says, you know what? Actually, they're the Antichrist. Now, before we get too smug about that, uh, what we're going to realize is that every one of us has the same capacity. But what's going on here is, number one, he says there are, plural, many antichrists. Number two, he says those who left his church were never really, never really truly part of the church. They left making it plain that they're not, they weren't ever part of us anyway. Uh, it's this idea that I spoke of earlier of living this lonely, isolated, forget everyone else, I hate everyone but you, sort of lifestyle. They left the church. They didn't just band together when they left the church. There's evidence that they splintered and just went their own way. And then the second thing he's, he's not, but number three, he is not saying that they're just not just part of his church, but he's saying that they're not part of the church. And he says they are antichrist. Okay, now, you've heard the word antichrist in relation to like horror movies, you know, or... Um, Maybe end time theology that gone awry, or I don't know, maybe it's in the Left Behind movies, I haven't seen them. Uh, but you've heard probably the word, the, the, the word antichrist. It's interesting to note, I want you to know this, 
you didn't learn anything else today, you learned this one thing. It's interesting to note that the word antichrist is nowhere else in the entire Bible besides in, in, in John's writing. In 1 John, in 2 John, um, 1 John chapter 2, verse John chapter 4, 2 John chapter 7, there are five places in which this word, look at this, here's, the, here's how it's spelled originally, antichristos, some of those, they're, they're Greek letters, so they're not the same as English, but that's the word, antichrists, plural, antichrist, and what do you see there, which you probably see is, is like, that it's, you see the English word, but if you separate it, the, the, the prefix away, you'd see that there's like anti or against or opposed to or other than Christ. Now, what you're about to learn is that every one of us uh, has the capacity to be a little antichrist, and here's why, because honestly, the word means other than Christ. And so what Paul is, or what John is saying is, are you living for other things, things other than Christ? Now he's being really hard. I guess he's probably, you know, his, his heart hurts. His, his, his heart hurts, rather. Uh, his heart hurts because people just left his church. But what he's really saying is they, they left the church and we trust under the, under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit that this is true. He's saying they left the church because they want to live for things other than Christ, besides Christ. They want to live for the world. And it's interesting to note that he says, like, and you know what? They never were Christ followers in the first place. It is now evident. It wasn't that they were Christ followers and then they left the faith. They never had faith. So John decentralizes this term, Antichrist. You know, we make it into, you know, the modern-day boogeyman or scapegoat or kukui or whatever. Like, like, we think the Antichrist is something that we are to hold at bay, and maybe there's an element of that, but, but actually look a little deeper because it may be that the Antichrist, the other than Christ, the opposition to Christ is actually closer to home than than you might think. What if I'm living like an antichrist, Randy? What, what if I am walking in darkness? What if I do hate people? What if I do love this world? Are you struggling with that this morning? Are you struggling with maybe you hate a family member? And nobody knows it but your family, you know, or maybe nobody knows it but you. And you say, I don't want to I don't want to be like that anymore. I mean you say this morning, you know, I just love, I just love my stuff. And I love the things of the earth, and I love the system of the earth. And I love this dog eat dog sort of system uh, that that we're living under, and, and I and I, I don't want that. I don't want that. You're struggling with that. You're hating people and, and loving stuff. Are you living a life? Maybe you could wear a placard. And I would not ask you to do this, but you could live, live a placard that might say, other than Christ. That's what I'm living for. Things other than Christ. You know, thing instead of Christ. You know, maybe would you, would that rightly be hung around your neck? Opposed to Christ, um, follower of Christ. That's what we want, right? Not opposed to. Listen, if this plays out in your life long enough, what, what a hatred of other people eventually leads to is a life, a life of isolation. You're like, nobody's good enough to love. Nobody's good enough for me. I'm just going to go it alone. That's the end result of, of hating people. And, and the end result the end result of loving this world is just all out greed and selfishness. 
That's where either of those roads will take you. And so what do I do, Pastor Randy? Uh, that, that marks me, that is me. What do I do? Now, would, I, would you expect me at this point to say, just try a little harder? Just do a little better. Just hold your breath a little longer. No, I wouldn't say that because that's not the gospel. I hope you know that. That's not the gospel. What do we do in times of need? What do we do in our lostness? We turn to Jesus. Jesus has known this day was coming, this, this, this enlightenment, this, this awareness. Jesus has always known that you've needed a Savior. Jesus has always known. Like, maybe your mama told you to try harder because you, you really got it inside of you. But Jesus, he knows that you don't have it inside of you. You need him inside of you. We'll end um, with this passage, and then we're going to run to the table of communion where we can, where we can rightly pray to, to Jesus and receive his grace in our lives. It says this, my little children, this is from two weeks ago, my little children, I'm writing these things to you so that you may not sin. But we already know is chapter one, he told us everybody sins. Quit acting like you don't sin, everybody sins. You, you say you don't sin, you, you're a liar and you make God out to be a liar. Let's be honest, right? My little children, I am writing these things to you so that you may not sin. But if anyone does sin, we have an, an advocate, parakletos, an advocate, a confidant, a helper with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. He is the propitiation for our sins. He has paid the penalty for our sins and, and not for ours also but for the sins of the world. So I invite you to now, as we, as we prepare to pray, I invite you to, to run to Jesus. Say, I don't want to live like that any, anymore, Jesus. I don't want to walk in darkness anymore. I want to walk in the light. I invite you to run to Jesus. Now, we're not running to the table of communion because literally the bread or literally the juice has the essence of Jesus wrapped in it. But we we, we do run to the table of communion out of obedience to Jesus because Jesus said, when you do this, remember me. And so that's what we do today. We, we remember and we celebrate the gospel, the good news of Jesus Christ. If you would bow with me in prayer.